Yes. Okay. So now it's recording now. Yeah. All right. I guess we can uh, we can start. Yes. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Haziza. I'm uh, from the University of uh, Ottawa, and welcome uh, to this session for the CRM SSC uh, Prize 2021. So before uh, starting, I just want to say a few words about, about the Jigo uh, Tao. Uh, so Jigo uh, was born in the Shandong province in China, uh, where he received, a, in 2002, he received a BSc in statistics from uh, Beijing Normal University. And then he came to Montreal at McGill University and uh, got his PhD under the supervision of Jim Ramsey. And after a, a postdoc, a one-year postdoc at Yale, he then he became a, a professor at uh, uh, the Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science, uh, in Simon Fraser University. And since 2020, he's, uh, he's, he's currently now a, a full professor. So his research interests are, uh, include functional data analysis. And the talk today will be about functional data analysis, statistical inference for complex dynamical models, and network modeling. He holds a Canada Research Chair in Data Science. He's a very prolific author. He has an outstanding publication record with over 70 papers published in top statistical journals, including uh, JASA, JRSSB, and Biometrics. He's an associate editor for several journals, uh, including, including uh, Biometrics and uh, the Canadian Journal of Statistics. And He's a highly uh, popular speaker. He gave more than uh, 80 lectures, uh, invited talks, seminars all over the world. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jigo Tao, the recipient of the 2021 CRM SSE Prize. The title of this talk uh, will be Flexible, Interpretable, and Scalable Analysis for Functional Data. Jigo, the floor is yours. OK. Thank you very much, David. Um, so first, uh, uh, my name is Ji Guo Tao. Um, first, I want to uh, thank David and uh, the CRM SSC Prize Committee uh, for choosing me. This is, uh, this is a great honor for me uh, to, to receive this award. Um, I know uh, there are uh, several outstanding statisticians uh, deserve this award too. Um, this is not an easy decision to make. Um, I also want to thank my nominator, uh, Dr. Richard Lockhart, Tom Logan, and Derek Bingham in various stages of my nomination. Okay. Um, this will not happen without their consistent support. I also want to thank my uh, referees uh, for, the, for their high recommendation. Um, I'm very grateful for my mentors, Dr. Tim Swartz uh, and Charmaine Dean for their tremendous support. Um, and, and, and collaborations. Next, I want to thank my PG supervisor, Dr. Jim Ramsey. Um, thank you. So when I first uh, uh, arrived in, at the start of my PhD study at McGill, I only have a bachelor degree and have no idea about <laughs> research. So Jim teach me how to do research, how to do critical thinking how to programming, how to write the papers, how to give talks. So Jim teaches me every aspect to be a good researcher. And uh, he's, uh, he's really my two models um, as a good researcher and a good supervisor and a good Canadian citizen. Thank you, Jim. Um, so next I want to thank my postdoc supervisor, Dr. Hong Yu Zhao. So he uh, took me to a very exciting research area statistical genetics. Many of my research is, re is coming from uh, the problem in genetics. And, and uh, I'm very grateful for, um, for his uh, su supervisor, supervision. Next, I want to thank my uh, excellent collaborators, my understanding students and, and uh, postdocs. Um, uh, this, my research cannot happen without uh, their, 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 their support. Uh, also grateful for my um, uh, very supportive colleagues at SFU and West Ontario. 
Um, I'm also grateful for my uh, kind of teachers at the McGill. So I also want to thank my wife, um, Liang Liang. So uh, my success, success cannot happen without uh, um, her uh, tremendous support uh, in all aspects of my life and my research. Um, so today is June 7th, actually is our wedding anniversary. Uh, so we, we, were, we, we, are, we were married in 2004, so it's uh, for 17 years now. So we, now we have uh, three beautiful kids. And um, um, yeah, so, so, so my, my Canadian dream come true. Uh, I also want to thank my parents, uh, my parents-in-law. So they are now living very close with us. They are uh, very helpful to take, to take care of our, uh, our kids. Okay, uh, so today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, three uh, research projects. Um, so this is kind of a uh, show, uh, uh, kind of will represent uh, uh, my um, uh, efforts to make a uh, uh, functional data analysis uh, more flexible, uh, interpretable, and uh, scalable. So uh, now uh, let's uh, uh, come to the first uh, problem. So I, I, I try to make the three problems uh, to be independent. Um, Okay, so the first problem is motivated from COVID-19. So uh, all our life has been changed by COVID-19 more or less. So until now, I just saw, give a quick number. We have over 168 million cases, over 3 million deaths. So this is really a significant change to our life in all aspects. And we know that the older people will face a um, higher risk for developing severe disease and uh, uh, from the COVID-19 virus. So the objective of this study is that we want to see how the population aging affects the mortality rate of COVID-19. And also we want to provide a healthcare infrastructure index for all countries. We all read the news that, you know, how different countries react to the outbreak of COVID-19. So we want to evaluate uh, the healthcare uh, system in different countries. And, and we want to see how the healthcare infrastructure influences the population aging effect. Uh, so this is a, a, a curve to show the percentage of COVID-19 deaths. Apparently, we can see that um, the senior people have a, have a high percentage of, of COVID-19 deaths. So by the way, um, please uh, uh, feel free to ask me questions. So uh, you can uh, write your questions in the chat windows. Um, and uh, and, and uh, so I, I think uh, Jim or David can see the chat screen and, and, uh, and, and, and can uh, tell me the questions it pop up. So the data is coming, uh, the COVID-19 data are coming from uh, the response repository of John Hopkins. So um, we set the starting time to be January 22nd, uh, 2020. This is the day when the first city, Wuhan city in China was locked down because of COVID-19. And we, the end of the date is November 30, 2020. That's the day when uh, exactly 120 days after 173 countries reached 100 confirmed cases. Because different countries have different outbreak time, so we set the we kind of align the time. So the t equal to zero means the country first reached the first 100 confirmed cases, and then we will follow up for 120 days for that country. And so now our t is go from zero to 120. So we have the data for 144 countries, including the mortality rate and the social economic coverage. So this uh, social economic uh, coverage is obtained from World Bank. So we have obtained the total population, the percentage of population with age over 65, GDP, the number of physicians, number of nurses, and number of hospital beds. So we first, we can fit a 
single index very coefficient model. So this is the single index very coefficient model. So on the left side is the YIT, is the COVID-19 mortality rate at the time T for the ice country. So we have one covariance aging represent the percent of population with age 65 and above. And here we have two uh, very coefficient, alpha one and alpha two. They are function of uh, the index ZI transpose beta. So here ZI is a vector of four uh, social economic variables, GDP, physicians, hospital beds, nurses, they are represent the healthcare, health, healthcare uh, infrastructure of that country. So we fit this model to uh, four, we divided the whole 120 days to four equal periods. Every period has 30 days. And, and then we fit the very coefficient model to each period separately. And uh, so this graph is to show the estimated alpha one and alpha two in this fourth stage. Each curve represents one very coefficient in one stage. We can see that this uh, uh, very coefficient alpha one, alpha two are very different at a different stage. So this uh, uh, motivates us to um, adding the dynamic effect of population aging on the COVID-19 mortality rate. So what we did is now we propose this uh, called a dynamic interaction same parametric function on scalar model or called a DCF. So basically here we have our response YIT. We call it a function response because it's a, the response is a function of time. And we have a scalar XI. This XI will not change our T. So in our case, it will be the uh, population aging in each country. And the alpha is the vector of very coefficients. So you can see here now, uh, this very coefficients is a bivariate function. It not only depends on T, it also depends on some other covariance ZI through the index ZI beta. And here, eta I represent the individual curve variations. We assume that they have mean zero and the covariance function RST. We will estimate RST from the data. We also have an error term. So the error term is a mean zero and have the current function epsilon IOT. We assume that the errors are independent for different time points. So this current function will be just identical with the function on the, on the diagonal part. Okay, so this is a general version of our DCF model. So if we compare this DCF model to the function on scalar model um, introduced at uh, the classic functional data analysis book given by Ramsey and Seelman 2005. So this is a function on scalar model. So we have response function and we have with the uh, covariance XI, the scalar variable. So if we can compare these two models, you can see here, we, we adding this index that I transpose beta. So we so now our functional coefficient alpha t can also depend on some additional covariates. So this is why we call this a dynamic interaction uh, model. So now let's uh, go go to the how it's uh, how the model will fit to the COVID nineteen data. So again, this is the DCF model we fit to the COVID-19 data. So we have the response YIT is a COVID-19 mortality rate is a function of time. Um, and we have the aging is a percent of population over age 65 and above. And we have these two um, bivariate very coefficient function alpha one, alpha two. Alpha one, alpha two will not, depend, not only depend on T, it also depends on the index that I transpose beta. So that I are this vector of four social economic variables. So this is the estimation, uh, estimated uh, uh, 
uh, coefficient for the for the index. So you see here we have the parameter beta. So beta is, is the key parameters we want to estimate. So so this is the estimation for the beta, and for this our four social economic variables. And you can see here all the coefficient is positive. So basically it means uh, uh, this, uh, we call this index UI as kind of the weighted average of these uh, four social economic uh, variable covariates. Uh, so, so when we do this uh, uh, fit, we first do the normalization um, on these four covariates. So they will have, they are, all these four covariates will have mean zero and variance equal to one. So, uh, so this uh, index UI will represent the healthcare infrastructure level related to the COVID-19 mortality. So a larger UI means a better healthcare infrastructure. So with this uh, beta, we now we can calculate the uh, healthcare infrastructure level for each countries. So this is the calculations uh, for all the 144 countries. Uh, so these countries are the top um, 20 or 30 countries. So we can see here, uh, Norway has the highest uh, healthcare infrastructure index over almost over four. And, uh, and we have Switzerland, Ireland, Sweden, Denmark, and uh, Canada is number 16. So around uh, the index is around 1.7. This also show um, the index for the for the um, for the countries with uh, a bad health care infrastructure. So you can see here now the index become negative because we have uh, doing the normalization on the on the four social economic um, variables. So so if the, the if if they have a low um, bad health care system, then they have negative they can have negative scores for this index. So we can see here the worst country is Somalia, and um, and and, and uh, so we have Brazil. Um, they, they, they are all negative. So China is a negative too, um, because China uh, they have a very high population. So so here we only look at the the number of hospital beds per one hundred uh, people, one thousand people. Sorry, and India is also has a um, has a low uh, rank on the healthcare. Infrastructure index. So, so, so now uh, we got this uh, uh, this uh, uh, healthcare uh, infrastructure index that I beta, and now let's look at uh, this uh, alpha two. So this alpha two represents how the population aging effect on the mortality, right? So um, let's look at how alpha two looks like. So this is uh, because alpha two is a bivariate function. So we plot the heat map of alpha two. So alpha two will be a function of t. Now is the days we have from zero to one hundred twenty days, and we also is also alpha two is a function of the index health care index u. So here the color here represents the value of alpha two. Okay, so you can see here uh, the red the the dark red means a positive number. If it's dark blue, means a negative number around minus four. Um, so uh, you can see here, for example, we look at the Indian. So Indian get their healthcare healthcare index is around minus uh, um, 0.9. So you can see here in this uh, in this early stage, like the first thirty days, this uh, alpha two is a dark red, means alpha two is positive. So it means in the first 30 days after, after the COVID-19 outbreak, the population aging will have a positive effect on the mortality rate. Because uh, if you have a bad healthcare system, the healthcare system cannot accommodate a quick increase of COVID-19 patients. So then it will in, re, re, lead to a high mortality rate. So if you look at uh, Canada, Canada is here. Is one point around one point eight, so you can see here, like uh, for Canada case, in the oh by the way, here we have some uh, empty white space here. The reason is uh, we actually do a test 
for the alpha two whether equal to zero or not. So if we test that alpha two is not significant from zero, we will not plot alpha two. So this zero regions means alpha two is around zero. It's not significant. So in other words, so if your healthcare system is good enough, you the healthcare system can accommodate outbreak COVID-19 and the population aging have no effect. So, so, so for if your healthcare is good enough. For Canada case, so actually, um, so the first uh, uh, 15 days after the, out, out, after the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, actually the alpha two is uh, slightly positive. So it means that uh, in Canada, healthcare system, it can accommodate the outbreak in, a, in the first break pretty easily. The population, population aging does not have a negative effect on the mortality rate. However, if you look at the later stage, like around 70 days to 120 days, that's the second outbreak in Canada. So we know the second outbreak in Canada is much higher than the first outbreak. That's uh, happening around uh, the fourth the season. So you can see now it becomes become dark red. So that means alpha two is negative. So in other words, in a second outbreak, Canada healthcare system cannot accommodate the, 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 the high increase, the quick increase of COVID-19 patients. So the population aging will have a positive effect on the mortality rate. On the other hand, if we look at the, the best country, Norway, Norway has uh, the healthcare system index about one, about four. You can see here, the, the color of this alpha two is always blue, means inactive. So in other, in other words, Norway is able to handle the, the, the outbreak of COVID-19 in the whole time period. And the population aging actually have no, uh, uh, positive effect on the mortality rate. Okay, so this is a, a one project we do on the, on the COVID-19 data. We also have uh, developed a hypothesis testing procedure to see um, whether this bivariate function can reduce to a univariate function. And uh, so this is the, these are the p-values. So you can see here, uh, so really um, the p-values are pretty small. So they show that uh, in this uh, model here, is is uh, is 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 appropriate for this uh, COVID nineteen data analysis. So this is the uh, estimation procedure. So basically, we pro, pro, uh, we propose a three step estimation procedure. So basically, here we will first doing a profile estimation for the two parameters beta and the bivariate function alpha here. So we will uh, for first given beta we can estimate alpha and, and, uh, and we do the profile estimation for beta alpha simultaneously. After we get the beta height and alpha height, we will estimate the covariant function uh, RST and sigma SS using the smoothing splines. After we get the covariant function, uh, we will uh, using this covariant function as the uh, extra weight on the, on the least squares uh, uh, criterion and we do the weighted profile least squares and we can improve the estimation for beta and alpha. So um, I will not uh, uh, go to the details. Sure, for the, so, so, so we will, I will not go to the details about the, the estimation procedure. So here is the summary of my talk the first project. So basically we'll propose a um, DCF model. So here we allowed this uh, uh, scalar queries XI has a dynamic interaction effect on the functional response YIT. And we have a bivariate covariate coefficient alpha. We are not depend, only depend on T, but also we also depend on the uh, covariate ZI through the index. And we propose a three-step estimation procedure we establish the asymptotic consistency and normality for the estimation. Um, we uh, provided the hypothesis testing for the for the for the bivariate very coefficient function, and we fit the our model to the COVID nineteen data, and uh, we got the healthcare infrastructure index uh, for this uh, 
uh, for 144 countries. I think this is a very good guideline uh, you know, to compare the, how different countries react to the outbreak of COVID-19. So these have been um, published uh, uh, in, in JASA recently, and, uh, and, and uh, I'm happy to share the copy if you want to know the more details. Okay, so now um, let me go to the second uh, project. Uh, I'm talking about uh, how we can make the functional data is uh, more interpretable. So, um, so here, this is a classic example uh, on functional data analysis. Basically here we have a scalar response to YI is the annual uh, precipitations for 35 Canadian cities. And we also have the functional covariance XIT is the delay temperature curves for the 35 cities, Canadian cities. So we want to investigate how the delay temperature affect the annual precipitations. So in this case, we will have a scalar covariance response, YI, and we have a functional covariance, XIOT. And so traditionally, we can choose uh, some um, discrete time points, T1 to Tj, and we can evaluate the co functional covariance Xi at these uh, uh, discrete time points. And we can treat the value of the function at these time points as, uh, as the predictors, and we can fit a multiple linear regression model. So the problem is that uh, here, we typically we will have a large number of uh, time points. So in that case, uh, we will have a large number of covariates. And, and uh, so in this case here, we only have 35 data points. So our T will, uh, will much bigger than N. So we will have, may have problem. And also we know that the, 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 the value of the, the temperature at different time point will be highly correlated. We'll have the temporal correlation. So this may not have, a, we will also bring problem, problem as well. And also how can we choose in the, the, the discrete time points? So we choose in 30, 100 or 355. So actually, if we here, uh, if we increase the number of time points um, for the T here, if we increase the, the, the number of point points, which is the number, the, the capital J here, then this is summation will naturally will become an integral. So now we are able to accommodate this functional covariance XIT using this integral. So this is the classic scalar on function linear model introduced at Ramsey and Seelman's book. So here we have this uh, um, scalar covariance, a uh, scalar response YI, uh, functional covariance XIT. And here this beta T serve as the weight of the cumulative effect of SIT on the YI. So beta T is very important here. So we can estimate alpha and beta T by doing the sum square, by minimizing the sum square errors. Okay, so because here we have a function beta t, so technically this functional coefficient of beta t is infinite dimension. So we cannot estimate the beta t directly. So a typical trick we will do is that we will write down beta t as a linear combination of basic functions. So here, uh, so we have uh, this uh, phi one to phi j are uh, basic functions, and uh, we can choose beforehand. And then we will have uh, the basic coefficients c1 to cj. We will estimate c1 to cj uh, from the data. And then we will, if we know c1 to cj, we know the basic functions, we will know the beta t. So if you're not familiar with the basic functions, uh, so we typically we have two uh, classic basic functions to choose. One is the free basic functions. If you want your function to be periodic, because we know free basic functions are periodic functions. So the second popular basic functions is called a B splines. Um, this is kind of show you um, a graph for the cubic B splines. And uh, so if you're not familiar, uh, cubic, uh, not familiar with B-spline basic functions, um, you can only know that uh, 
for the cubic B splines, uh, cube B splines, it uh, only depends on two things. The one thing is the location of the nodes. So the location nodes here is uh, marked by this vertical dashed line in this graph. The second uh, is uh, depends on the order or the order of the, the B splines. So basically here for the B splines in each segment, it's a piecewise polynomial functions. So if you de define the, the degree of the polynomial functions and also define the location of the nodes, then we will define the cubic B spline basis functions. So this is the results we, when we do the fit to the Canadian weather data. And uh, so here, we're using 11 free basis functions to represent this uh, functional coefficient beta t. And this is the estimation looks like. This is the beta t. We know that the beta t serves as the weight of the cumulative effect of xit on the yi. But here, this beta t has too many fluctuations. So actually, it's very hard to interpret the beta t. So how to, to interpret the estimated function beta t is, is, a, is a bottleneck in functional data analysis. So what we can do is that we can add a roughness penalty on the beta t to control the smoothness about the beta t. So here, we typically we will use define the, uh, the roughness of beta t by doing the second derivative of beta t. So this is a penalty term defined by the second derivative of beta t. And we know that if a beta t has a smaller second derivative, means the beta t will be sm smoother. So this is the estimated results, estimated beta t when we're using 35 free basic functions. So we can see here, we now using a larger number of basic functions. But because we have this rough in the penalty term, I set the smoothing parameter lambda to be 10 to 12.5. You can see here, we can get a pretty smooth estimate on the beta t. And, uh, and, and, uh, so, um, so much, much smoother, much less fluctuations, but uh, it's still a little bit hard to, to understand this beta t. And uh, so you see here, this beta t is closer to zero, right? And this part beta t is, is higher than beta t. So what we typically will do is that uh, uh, we will construct the confidence intervals for the beta t. So this is the dash line is a pointwise confident intervals for beta t, and you can see here, this uh, the 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 time before two hundred fifty is like roughly before September, the beta t uh, the confident interval continues zero means uh, the temperature before September had no effect on the annual precipitations, and uh, the temperature after September will be significantly positive means that the temperature after September will have a positive effect on the annual precipitations. However, when we show this graph to our students or the collaborators, they still feel like, uh, you know, little bit of um, headache to understand this beta t. So, so what we are thinking that, you know, if beta t can show that xit has no effect on the response yi. Why not we can keep the beta t to be equal to zero, right? Everybody knows that if beta t equal to zero, means the xit will have no effect on the yi because beta t is served as a weight in the integral, right? So therefore, uh, we propose a locally sparse estimator for functional linear model. And uh, so we propose a function a scar penalty uh, so, uh, to control the sparseness about the beta t. So this third term here is the functional scar penalty we proposed here. So, um, so the p lambda here is a scar penalty function. And if you're not familiar with a, a scar function, and so this is the plot of the scar function, it is a popular choice when we want to control the sparseness of, of the model. So you can see here, 
our functional scar penalty basically is a summation of the scar function of the value of the beta on small intervals from tj minus one to tj. So basically we divided the beta t to this uh, small interval tj from tj minus one to tj. So we, we will try to squeeze beta t equal to zero at these small regions if it's not significant from zero. So we show the oracle properties for our estimating. So we show that, uh, you know, if the true beta t equal to zero, our estimated beta t will equal to zero with probably 10 to one. And also we can show that uh, if the true beta t not equal to zero, we have the asymptotic normality for the beta hat t. So now let's go back to our Canadian weather data. And uh, you can see here, we try to investigate how the delay temperature affecting the annual precipitations. And we want to estimate the beta t. So here, the red line is our uh, estimation, estimated beta t. You can see here, roughly our beta t will be strict, strictly equal to zero before September. So this is kind of very easy to show that the temperature before September will have no effect on the annual precipitations. So this will uh, help the interpretation of the result significantly. So this is a summary of the second project. So basically I introduced the functional linear regression model. So uh, it is a, a very um, beautiful model um, to move from the summation to the integral when we want to accommodate in the functional covariates. We typically we will add roughly the penalty to control the smoothness of the functional coefficients. And here we also added the functional scar penalty to identify the zero region of functional coefficients to enhance the interpretability of the results. So this result have been published uh, at the GCGS in 2014-17. So now uh, let me um, go to the, the third project. So when we have, uh, um, uh, how can we make the functional data analysis more sc scalable? So now big data is a popular topic. We all know that now we have, we have uh, more and more data available to us. And uh, so we have, which means we have more information, but also it uh, brings uh, challenges um, when we, when we uh, analyze this big data. Um, so for example, if you have large data, it may, um, may be under the memory limit of our computer and the computing time may be longer than, than, than we, um, uh, we can wait. So one popular approach when we handle the massive data is doing the subsampling method. So basically we can take a random subsample from the massive data and then we can do the estimation based on the uh, subsampled data. So mo the most straightforward uh, uh, method is called a uh, uh, uniform subsampling. So we just uh, sample the data uniformly and, and, and we look at how the est do the estimation on the uh, sum subsampled data. Um, so there's a more advanced uh, method for the subsampling methods uh, for linear regression model, uh, logistic regression, uh, generalized regression, and a quantile regression. Um, however, there's no work uh, to study the functional regression uh, when we do the subsampling approach. So this is the, our motivation example. So here we have the uh, global climate data set from NASA. So basically they have a very complicated global climate model. They can simulate the climate data um, from past and to the future. So now we have the global climate data from 1950 to 2100. 
So the, the globe is divided into over 1 million grid points. The data we have, including the delay average temperature and the delay precipitations. So the whole data set will be over one terabyte um, uh, size. So what we do here is that uh, we want to study how the delay average temperature will affect the annual precipitations. So we are thinking because of the climate change, maybe the delay temperature will have a, a different effect on, on the annual precipitation from the past to the future. So we fit a functional linear model uh, to address this problem. So our response is the logarithm of the total annual precipitations uh, uh, for each grid point. So this, uh, this I is, is, is the index for the uh, grid in the, in the globe. So we have one, one, over 1 million grids. And, and uh, so we look at, uh, we fit this functional linear model um, to the data. And uh, so we will fit this model uh, for, for each year separately, okay? So, so for each year, we will find uh, uh, estimated beta T. This beta T represented the effect of the temperature, delay temperature on the precipitations. So we will see how the beta T change over different years. So here is the uh, um, extra challenging when we work on massive functional data. So first in functional data, um, each of our functional unit of functional data is a curve, right? When we have a curve, this curve may have multiple or large measurements. So in other words, our number of data points will be higher than the number of curves. And also, when we fit the functional, functional models, we typically, we were using the basic functions to represent the functional, functional parameters. So for example, if we using the uh, B splines as our basic functions. Hey, Jigo, I, I will stop you. There is a question on your slide. Um, yes. The question is how do you choose the value of the smoothing parameter lambda? Is there any method or criteria do you use? Yes. Yeah. So this is a very, very good question. Uh, so, so, um, so there's no, like, uh, uh, I think there's no uniform uh, solution to choosing the smoothing parameter. Uh, so basically, uh, one I find is a uh, is good way to do is do the cross validation. So we typically will call the leave one curve out cross validation. So every time we will leave one functional data or curve out, and we can do look at how the prediction looks like when we leave that curve out. So this is a one uh, computational intensive way, okay? And so there's a kind of a, a more easier way to do is we can use in the BIC, um, Bayesian information criteria I, I listed here. And also we can also choose in like a generalized cross validation GCV as well. Yes, this is a very good question. A following up, a follow up question. Why not maximum likelihood estimation? Why maximum likelihood estimation to estimate the smoothing parameter? Um, yes, this is a this is a very good question. Um, yes, so so actually, uh, I see. Um, for example, um, um, I see people using the a uh, restricted likelihood to do estimation for the smoothing parameter as well. Actually, uh, they find uh, the REMO estimation actually uh, can provide a uh, good estimation for the smoothing parameter. But I, I didn't try the REMO estimation myself, but uh, I know, um, for example, Simon Wood uh, like REMO a lot. And so he using REMO uh, criteria to choose the smoothing parameter in his uh, MGCV uh, uh, package. This is a very good question. Yes, it's, it's tricky to choose the smoothing parameter. Yes. Any other questions?
No, so far it's okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so as, uh, as we just uh, discussed, so when we estimate the functional coefficients, we need to choose the smoothing parameters to control the smoothness of the functional coefficients. So it, it's not, a not easy. And also we need to choose, uh, when we when we choosing the uh, basic functions, for example, using the B splines, we need to choose the number of nodes. So we generally, we were choosing a large number of nodes. And, and uh, so the number of basic functions will be uh, pretty large. So um, so our, the time complexity uh, for the computation actually is pretty high. And uh, if you think about, if we want to do in, using the bootstrap to find, to construct the confidence intervals, we will even need to do more computation. So, so, so the, the, the time can, the computing time really is a big problem when we do the functional uh, model. So this is uh, this is the uh, show you for our global climate data. So remember, we have one million grid points in the globe. So this is to show you the if we do the uniform sum sub sampling, this is what the sampling points looks like, right? Very uniformly located on the globe. And uh, if we do the do our proposed estimation, we call a functional L optimality sub sampling, or call a flaws. Uh, method. So this is our flaws estimation. So you can see here for our flaws subsampling on the grid point, you can see here we got a more dense uh, sampling in the uh, Atlantic Ocean around the equator and, and uh, in the Arctic regions and in the Ar uh, Antarctic regions. I will explain why we, we, do, we, we have to sample more in these regions later on. Okay, so now let's uh, let, let's uh, let's uh, uh, go back to the uh, some technical details. So basically, we want to during the doing the subsampling for these uh, functional linear models. So here, I first I centralized the response y i and the functional predictor x i t. So I don't have an intercept term here. I will focus on the estimation for the beta t. Beta t is a key parameter we want to estimate. Beta t represented the effect of the functional uh, graphs xit on the yi. Okay, so, so again, we will do our FDA trick. So we will write down our functional coefficient of beta t as a linear combination of the basic functions. So we will typically, we are choosing the B spline basic functions on uh, phi j. So this is should be phi, phi t here. Okay, and uh, this, this also has to be phi t, sorry about that. Um, so, so then we can um, estimate this, uh, uh, this basic coefficient of CJ by minimizing this uh, penalized sum squares. Um, so here in this second term, we have this roughing penalty term. As we just uh, uh, talked, we have to spend time to choose this smoothing parameter very carefully, okay? Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the estimation. So we have uh, uh, developed the, the asymptotic normality um, for the estimated beta t from the four data. So here, beta hat t is our estimation for the four data. And uh, so this is the variance for beta hat t. So we can see here, in this uh, variance uh, term here, we have this uh, h trampled gh tramples, sorry, h inverse gh inverse. So, this really come with uh, this uh, smoothing term, smoothing uh, parameter lambda term here, okay? So this, you can see this variance form will, will be very different from the traditional linear regression model. And we cannot use the exist subsampling method in the linear regression model for our functional linear model here directly. Okay, so now, Let's, uh, let's think about how can we find the optimal subsampling um, probability PI. So basically, we will sample the data with the probability PI, the summation of PI equal to one, okay? So we will estimate the functional linear model from the subsampling data, uh, giving a probability PI, right? And then we denote the estimated coefficient from the sampling data as beta 2 dot t. And so this is the asymptotic distribution for beta 2 dot t. And this is the variance 
for the for the beta tutor t. And uh, so inside this term here, we have a WP matrix. And the, the formula is very complicated. We find it's hard to calculate this WP uh, directly from the data. So what we do is that uh, uh, instead of looking at asymptotic normality for beta tilde t, we look at the asymptotic normality for the difference between the beta tilde t to beta hat t. So here beta hat t is the estimated beta t from the full data. Beta tilde t is the estimation from the subsample data. So ideally, we want our beta tilde t to be close to our beta hat t, right? So, so this is the asymptotic variance for this uh, difference of these two estimator. Based on this distribution, we can derive the asymptotic integrated mean square error of beta hat, beta tilde in approximating beta, beta hat. So this is the formula. Yes. So, so you can see here, uh, so in this uh, integrated mean square, ideally we want to minimize this integrated mean square error, right? We want to minimize this, okay? So you can see here inside of this formula, only one matrix V depend on the sub, sub sampling probability PI, okay? So, in, so now we can try to minimize the matrix VP, then we can minimize the integrated mean square error of this difference, right? So here, we choose to minimize the trees of the matrix VP. So this is the, if we want to, we minimize the trees of the matrix VP. And this is the derived optimal subsampling probability. Okay. So you can see here in this uh, uh, numerator, um, we have two terms. The first term is the uh, fitted residuals. And, uh, and the second term is the, is the phi i here. It basically, it's the inner product of the functional covariance x i with the basic function phi t. So, so this, this phi i will be similar to the uh, leverage score in the linear model. So you can see here, the optimal subsampling probability will depend on residuals and also depend on this uh, covariance information. So here is the estimation procedure. So basically we can first, because our estimate meter only will depend on the inner product of XIT and the basic functions. So we will calculate this integral first. We call it a sa i. And then we can store sa i only then we can remove XIT from our computer. We don't need the XIT anymore, okay? So we only need a far I and a YI y in, the, in the computer. So the, the data size will be reduced. Then we will draw a subsample of size L with a uniform subsampling probability, and we get the pilot estimation for the basic coefficients. And after we get the basic coefficients, we will calculate the optimal subsampling probability PI and then we're using the optimal subsampling probability PI to draw a random subsample with a replacement of size L. And then we will estimate the functional linear model using the sample data. And we can also, we can tune in the smoothing parameter lambda by minim minimizing BIC of, by using this sample data as well. So here is the advantage for our flaws method. So basically, the computing, computational time will significantly reduced, and also um, it will increase our memory limit significantly. And also a byproduct is that uh, because we can do the subsampling uh, on the parallel computing, so then we can do the bootstrap pretty easily because we will have a separate subsampling data set in different uh, computer, um, and, and then we can do the bootstrap. So this is the result when we do the simulation study. So here, beta t is the true beta t in the functional linear model. Beta tilde t is the estimated beta t from the sam sam sample data. And we look at the integrated mean square error. And you can see here, uh, the black line is our flaws estimation. 
and uh, the red line is uh, when we use the uniform subsampling. You can see here, our integrated mean square error is much lower than the uniform subsampling method. So this is a comparison of uh, the computational time when we have uh, 1 million functional data, okay? So uh, this, is, uh, this is our subsample size. And you can see here, um, like uh, uh, our computational time floss method is much lower than we using the full data. And also the computational time is only slightly larger than when we using the uniform subsampling method. So now let's uh, uh, go back to our uh, global climate data set from NASA. So now we have uh, 1 million functional data. Um, and, uh, and, and we try to look at how the daily average temperature affecting the annual precipitations um, by fitting this functional linear model. So we will fit the functional linear model for each year separately, and we will get a beta t for each year separately. We will look at how this beta t change over the years. Remember, this beta t re represents the weight of the cumulative effect of temperature on the annual precipitation. So this is uh, this is again the graph I sh show you. Um, per, uh, so so this is the when we do the uniform subsampling on the globe global grids. This is our flaws subsampling method on the globe grids, and you can see here again we have more sampling points in the uh, Atlantic Ocean around the equator and more sampling points at the Arctic regions and the Antarctic regions. So if we go back to our um, sampling probability PI here, so we know that the sampling probability PI will not only depend on residuals, it also will depend on the functional predictors, the leverage scores of the functional predictors. So if we look at the leverage scores of this, uh, of this temperature, so basically is the, is the norm of the inner product of the temperature with the basic functions. You can see here the temperature in the Antarctic regions and the Arctic regions and the equator has, a, has a more blue uh, points. So um, means is a higher values. Um, because they have more extreme temperature. And if you look at the uh, residuals, the fitted residuals, you can see here the Arctic oceans, um, sorry, uh, Atlantic oceans are, are along, along, and the Indian oceans along the equator has more blue points, means they have a higher residuals. Therefore, they will get more sampling points at this area. So this is uh, how we assess the estimation accuracy by look at the uh, empirical integrated mean square error. So basically we estimate the beta hat t from the full data and we have the beta tilde t is from the subsample data. And uh, uh, we look at how close our subsample method estimation to the full data estimation. And uh, you can see here uh, the Black line is using our flaws estimation. The red line is using the uniform subsampling estimation. And you can see here, our estimation have much lower uh, integrated mean square error compared to the uniform method. So this is, uh, we look at uh, the estimated beta t for different years in 1950, 2020, and 2100. You can see here, uh, we can look at this blue line represent the beta t in 2100, you can see here, this blue lines beta T is more positive around 90 is in the spring season and more negative around 150 is around the summer season. So here beta T serve as the weight of the temp cumulative effect of temperature on the precipitations. So beta T is positive here, negative here, so basically this can be interpreted as the change of the temperature from the spring to the summer. So in other words, in 2100, 
the change of the temperature from spring to the summer will have a higher impact on the annual precipitation. Okay, so we also generalized our method to handle the generalized functional linear model when the response of y is from a exponential family like a Poisson distribution or binomial distribution. And we, here we will have a link function g here. So we fit our generalized functional linear regression model to our kidney transplant data. So here, um, so we have uh, over 130,000 uh, patients um, with kidney transplant. So the, these patients have uh, at least a 10 year follow up after their kidney transplants. So every year, they will measure their EGFR values. EGFR is a uh, is, is a, is a um, clinic uh, indicator how our kidney function function. So if we have a higher GF, EGFR, means our kidney is good. If EGFR, EGFR is low, means our kidney is bad. So, so this, uh, uh, we have two group. The first group is uh, the patient who died between before 10 years after transplant and the Second group, Y equal to one, means the patient who live at least 10 years after transplants. So this is the average EGFR curves for the first six years for these two group. Apparently the, 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 the Y equal to one group is higher than the, than, than the uh, lower, uh, the, the Y equal to one group. So, our objective is to study how the, how the uh, EGFR in the first six years after transplants um, can predict whether the patient can survive over 10 years. Okay, so here we fit this uh, logistic uh, functional linear regression model. So y i equal to one means the patient live, have lived at least 10 years after the transplants. And uh, the EGFR T is the trajectory of EGFR on the first six years, okay? So then we will fit this, EG, this fun, logistic functional linear regression model to the data. We have over uh, 100,000 uh, patients. So we can look at uh, how our estimation looks like by look at the empirical integrated mean square error, like uh, how close our estimator from the subsample data compared to the estimator from the full data. So the blue line is our flaws estimation and uh, the red line is the uniform estimation, some sampling estimation. So you can, can, you can see that uh, our uh, flaws estimators has a consistently lower uh, integrated mean square error than the uniform subsampling method. And also we can look at how the estimation beta t looks like. So here, this uh, red dotted line is the estimated beta T from the full data when we have one, over 130,000 patients. And the solid black curve is our estimated beta T from our subsample data when we only have 5,000 sample data. And you can see here, our estimation is almost exactly the same as the estimation from the full data. And also, we can come with the confidence intervals uh, using our subsample data. And uh, you can see here, um, the, only the beta T uh, after, six year, after four years has a significantly positive effect on the, on, on the, on the probability of a survival over 10 years. So this is the summary of our third project. So basically we propose a functional error optimality subsampling method um, for estimating the functional linear model and the functional general linear models from massive functional data. So we establish the asymptotic uh, results for our subsample estimators. And uh, the simulation study show that our estimation is a completion feasible and uh, get a more higher accurate estimation than the uniform subsampling method. So we have anal analyzed uh, the global climate data and the kidney transplant data. And in both applications, we show that our estimation method 
is better than the uniform subsumption method. This, uh, yes. Sorry, uh, uh, question. Yes. Uh, are there any uh, reason for wider confidence interval for small beta values in your previous slides? Can you see the question? Can can you, can you see the question again? Sorry. Can you see? Can you see the question again? Okay, I see the question. Are there any are, are there any reason for wider confidence interval for small beta values in your previous slides? Yes. Okay, this is a very good question. Um, I think uh, the reason is that uh, when the beta t is uh, is is uh, close to zero means that it has a uh, more uncertainty i think uh so maybe that's the reason it has a wider wider range yeah that's my first uh, uh first thinking but, but but i haven't thought about this problem before it's a very good question and and also if you see a wider range on the on the boundary part um this is uh, called the boundary effect so when we estimate the beta t not parametrically because we don't have the data on the left boundary, left side of the left boundary and right side of the right boundary. Therefore, the uncertainty for estimating beta t in the, uh, in the boundary regions has a, has a higher uncertainty. Therefore, the common interval will be wider. Okay, yes. Okay, this is a very good question. Okay, so this result has been um, uh, put on archive, and 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 you can see more details uh, from the from the paper. So this is uh, the summary of my talk. So basically, I show um, like uh, three projects uh, uh, we we have done. So we try to make functional data analysis more flexible, uh, more interpretable, and 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 uh, working for the big data as well. Okay, uh, so. So um, this is a reference uh, for the release literature. And uh, I want to thank for your attention. I'm, I'm open for any further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jigo. Uh, so it's time for question, but there is one question that was asked earlier from uh, Patrick Brown. Uh, apologies, Patrick, uh, for not asking uh, the question before. I think, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think it uh, it's on the page, to, uh, slide 24. Okay. Uh, uh, the question is, if you iterated this, would it, would it converge to the MLE? That's what the question is. Okay. Uh, you see, this is, a, this is a good question. Um, yeah, we, we haven't started study the convergence uh, um, of this uh, this procedure yet. Yeah. Any other question? No question. I have a small comment on the integral from one to 365. I think it should be from zero to 365 because if the integral from one to six, uh, 365 only cover 364 days. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah, this is a good point. Thank you, you're right. Any other question, comment? Hi, Jiguo. Yes. Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, in your first project, you looked at the first 120 days for each country after a certain condition was met, right? Yes. How did you choose that number of days? And did you look at any kind of sensitivity analysis for how it changes if you use a different number? Yes, this is a very good question, yes. Uh, so when we submitted the papers, the referee asked the same question. Uh, so like actually, you know, when we, we do the first version, um, you know, uh, we only cover the first 60 days, I think. 
and 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 after you know after we wait for three months, they they come with the comments, make the decision, ask us to make the revision, and uh, so so you know naturally we have three more months. So we actually tried the one twenty days. Actually, the result are actually pretty consistent. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just uh I I present my talk with my daughter yesterday, and uh, she's the twelve, and she asked me I should uh, attend my time to the third wave, like, you know, Canada now go to survey, maybe we will have different results. Yes, good question. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Reza. You wanna open your mic? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, th this was great. Um, my question is a, is, is a, is a bit uh, general, uh, if I may ask here, particularly because you're an expert in the functional data, is that, um, we, we developed these confidence intervals, which are, which are mostly point-wise, right? Yes. Um, and then, and then uh, the, 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 the main idea would be, um, well, the, ideally we would like a band uh, as opposed to a point-wise confidence interval. Yes. Uh, my question has two aspects. One is that how could we go about getting the band rather than a point-wise? But the more important one is that how would you then come in to interpret a point wise when, for example, some of the points are out, well, let's say you're talking about the zero-ness, then you want to talk about over time or over whatever is your x, um, x axis. But when you want to interpret it, because you are, you're bound to interpret it point wise, but what you're really interested in is not really point wise, you want it to be overall. H how, do you, how do you deal with the interpretation or if that doesn't work, how do you go about getting a simultaneous interval for the whole band? And how do you interpret that one? Thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah, this is a, this is a, a very good question indeed. Uh, so yes, so that's a, that's a, 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 basically that, that's a challenge for functional data analysis. Uh, so, so most time we can only come with the point of confidence intervals. So that's a little bit of awkward work. And, and we definitely want the simultaneous confidence band for the functional coefficients, uh, I believe it's pretty challenging because uh, uh, because of we when we do the basic function approximations, uh, it's hard to derive the asymptotic normality for the estimated uh, uh, coefficient function. Um, so so I believe there's a there's a, like uh, some literature uh, available about the simultaneous simultaneous confidence bands. So you can you can do the do the search. Um, although very limited, yes. Uh, so ideally, we want to have the simultaneous confidence bands. So maybe that's a, that that that's a, the the one motivations when we derive the sparse estimation for the functional coefficients. We think that kind of will somehow avoid this uh, this awkward words. So 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 we only have you know we have the beta t three three equal to zero there. We can tell our collaborator, okay, here means there's no effect. <laughs> yes, but definitely confidence the band is, is the ultimate goal for us to do. Yes. Thank you. Yes. We have time for a few other questions. Christian? Uh, Jigo, congratulations on uh, this great talk and this award. Uh, in, in the data set, you had uh, the NASA data set, you had uh, the date 2100. Uh, presumably, we don't have those data. Uh, this, data this, are, this data are open, open available, yes. No, 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 but 2100. Oh, 2100, that's right, yes. Okay, but we're in 2020. <laughs> yes, this is a uh, yes. This is a little bit confused. So basically, uh, when uh, so so here is like a NASA. They they, they have uh, uh, some uh, climate scientist. So they, they based on their understanding on the on the climate, they develop a called a global climate model. So it's a very complicated uh, partial differential equation models. And, and then they kind of will simulate these uh, partial differential equation models on big computers over 1 million grid points on the globe. And, and they kind of will uh, uh, simulate how our climate looks like in 100 years. 
So, so, the, okay. so this data is not the true observed weather data. This is, uh, this is the output from their global climate model. So we treated this. Although, yes. Presumably until a few years ago, this must be the real data. It's only afterwards that it's uh, data from their model, right? Yes. Yeah. I think uh, the goal for, for their global climate model is that uh, they want their output to be matched our observed uh, weather data. 